In the 1990s, the rails of North America were graced by an excursion train unlike anything that came before it. Lavishly appointed inside and out, it was meant to convey the glamour and old-world charm of rail travel from the other side of the pond. Upholding such a highly guarded reputation while navigating the requirements to make such a venture viable would be a tall order. After all, how could you match something so coveted and beloved with a name like the American Orient Express. The original Orient Express has been described as the King of Trains. Inaugurated in 1883, this trans-European express train set an all-new high for comfortable, luxurious rail travel. At its peak, the name and equipment was used on five different routes across Europe, but would soon fall from favor with changing tastes in the traveling public. In the sale of its rolling stock in the early 1970s, many of the carriages would be acquired over time by businessman James Sherwood, who had the cars refurbished to their original splendor. What became known as the Venice Simplon Orient Express is an expanded version of the original train, operating principally between Venice and Italy and Calais in France, with an affiliate Pullman service connecting with London. It's world class from end to end. Both the allure and the business model of this train proved very influential, especially to Florida entrepreneur William Spann. While the European style of the Orient Express didn't match up with some of the United States' named trains, Spann believed that bringing some of that old world elegance could fill a void in the high end leisure travel market. Spain would partner with various European rail tour operators and American entrepreneurs and investors to acquire 14 lightweight passenger cars. Refurbished at the cost of $1 million for each car, the end result was a close homage to their European counterparts. On November 15, 1989, the American European Express was inaugurated rather modestly. Its first incarnation was just five cars coupled on the back of Amtrak's Capital Limited between Chicago and Washington, D.C. The reception was rather lukewarm, between the modest scenery of the routes and the target demographic of business travelers being turned off at the triple-digit fares. Over time, this route went from six nights a week to tri-weekly, and a new route between Chicago and New York was added on the Broadway Limited. In March 1991, both routes were suspended in favor of a new route through West Virginia's much more photogenic New River Gorge, with a stop at the Greenbrier Resort in White Sulphur Springs. Although this standalone version of the train was attracting more riders, it still fell way below expectations. The new operation would try throughout 1991 to gain more support for their business. They were met with setbacks at every turn, first by a grade crossing collision that derailed all but one of the cars, then by a pedestrian strike hardly three months later. With the rapid succession of these incidents, an expected insurance payment went unreceived, and investors withdrew their support, leaving the AEE with no choice but to refund patrons for their cancelled excursions. The American European Express would hold its final run on October 14th of that year. Three years after the AEE's demise, the cars would be pulled out of storage for a one-off Branson Limited excursion from San Antonio, Texas to its namesake city in Missouri. This run had been organized by George Pierce, the former operator of the Texas Dinner Train, who came to be impressed at the potential behind the destinations. Throughout the latter half of 1994, more trips would be operated with these cars, which would soon be relettered for the new business venture, the American Orient Express. In July 1995, the newly rebranded train departed Sacramento, California, on its first long-distance run to Denver and Chicago. This was now a completely standalone train, and the only one of its kind that was privately owned and operated across the whole country. 
the now 11-car consist was pulled along by conventional Amtrak locomotives, with the operating logistics being handled by TCS Expeditions. Journey offerings throughout the 90s consisted of the Great Transcontinental Journey between Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles, and the National Parks of the West, which featured motor coach tour connections to the parks themselves. Both types of trips were priced accordingly. It was no secret that the target demographic was the richest 10% of travelers. Trips were offered as week-long packages as an alternative to cruise ships, traveling at a slower pace than normal Amtrak services. The success of the operation over two seasons became one of great responsibility, which prompted the company's sale in 1997 to a syndicate of venture capitalists led by Henry Hillman Jr., who operated ocean and river cruises alongside the Montana Rockies Rail Tours. More cars were added, and more routes were offered throughout the 90s and early 2000s, with the ambition of forming a second train that would simultaneously tour the country and offer even more travel opportunities. As this sister train was starting to take shape, though, things started to get unstable. One particular complaint was the overall age of the cars, which became apparent with faults like sporadic air conditioning and water pressure for sinks and showers. Occupancy was priced to match the grandeur, with prices starting at near $4,000 in deluxe double bedrooms, complete with the same amount of space as the original Pullman compartments from way back when. Couples who were paying $11,000 each, expecting the high dollar amenities the trains were advertised with, were expecting more space. After losing a court case where it failed to exclude itself from the Railroad Retirement Board, the ensuing legal action, pressured by their European counterparts, would force the company to sell all of its assets in April of 2007. By that time, Colorado Railcar was a new owner, which renamed the train the Grand Lux Express. It was still business as usual for the train's transcontinental endeavors, hitting up majestic destinations within the U.S. In late 2008, the world slipped into an economic recession, and the ultra-rich patronage thinned out. The Grand Lux would make its final run on August 28th to Tacoma, Washington, and the entire train set was put up for sale. The buyer would be Zantera, a resort company owned by transport tycoon Philip Anschutz. The cars would be brought to the company's worksite in Denver in 2009, and work would begin to extensively renovate the entire fleet, with a new paint scheme, and a new name, the American Railway Explorer. The business model for this train was very similar to the tried and true method, with an emphasis on visiting national parks where Zantera had a share in managing the resorts. But the recession had taken its toll on its business model, which forced the company into liquidation before the train's renovation was even completed. Throughout 2011, many of the cars would be sold off to new owners. Of the estimated 33 passenger cars that the train rostered, 15 ended up with the Greenbrier Presidential Express, which proposed running a steam-powered excursion train between Washington and White Sulphur Springs. But this plan also failed to materialize, owing more to capacity issues with freight railroads and approval from the Federal Railroad Administration. There have been other attempts at introducing regular private car service. Iowa Pacific's Pullman Rail Journeys was priced for the middle class in an attempt to broaden the niche's appeal. Today, even after Amtrak's revisions to its private car guidelines, these first-class experiences are little more than just a car on the back of an Amtrak train, if they can pass all of the requirements. It's too easy to beg the question, does ultra-luxurious rail travel have a place in the U.S.? Well, since the final run in 2008, many things in the world have changed, ranging from public taste and pricing to ever-changing social habits, which makes marketing such an extravagant experience to new generations all the more challenging, more so than regular mainline excursions, or even normal tourist railroads. Over in Europe, the Venice Simplon Orient Express is still very much flourishing, attracting guests from the world over. 
Extravagantly named trains throughout the world like the Royal Scotsman, the Pride of Africa, the Indian Pacific, and the Rocky Mountaineer have all tapped into a certain demographic within its very specific niche and have greatly enjoyed successful lifespans in conditions that are hard to find in the U.S. That being said, the Rocky Mountaineer has started operating its first All-American route from Denver to Moab, Utah in August of 2021. Whether this route succeeds in the long run and prove that extravagant rail travel can still work here remains to be seen. Looking back, it's incredible that the American Orient Express lasted as long as it did. Although its upscale environment was out of reach for most travelers, it gave its patrons a taste of what rail travel was like in another world, in another time. <laughs>